Hey guys, it's Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another one of our weekly webinars. Now, I'll probably throw in a few of you here because we are a few hours earlier than normal, but it's probably not going to make too much difference if you're watching this after it's been posted live out on our YouTube channel. And today we're going to be covering a subject that is my personal passion, which is drag racing. We're going to be covering off drag racing data analysis. And before we get into that, I'm just going to go through a few other things that have been going on around here over the last week. I'm going to focus during this pre-show here a little bit about one of the builds that uh, we're really proud of as well, a car that we built for one of our customers that claimed a world record. Later as we get into the actual body of the webinar, we're going to be having a look at the data from that car on its actual world record pass and see exactly what we're looking for when we're trying to optimise the tune of the car at the racetrack, modify the amount of power that the car is making through the gears as it goes down the racetrack and basically get the most out of that package, basically matching the amount of power to the amount of available traction. Before we do get into that though, I just wanted to mention that we have released our latest video, so we'll head across to my laptop screen for a moment. And uh, this is a tech tour that we shot while we were over at SEMA last year in 2019. This is a tour of Rob Darm's four row tube framed FD RX7 and there's probably a few of you out there who are already following Rob on YouTube he's been documenting the whole process and I think by stalking a couple of Instagram accounts yesterday I have a suspicion it actually ended up going on the dyno yesterday so we'll wait with bated breath to see uh, what comes out of that. The 4 rotor engine in particular one of the most popular or most coveted I should probably say in the rotary engine family particularly given that you can't buy a four rotor engine in a production Mazda rotary vehicle. So uh, it's obviously based on the four rotor engine that won Le Mans famously for Mazda in the 787B. It was a Mazda uh, in-house race engine and there's obviously a lot of companies around the world, or actually it's not a lot, there's a handful of companies around the world who have basically made up kits to allow uh, enthusiasts to produce a four rotor engine of their own. Definitely, in my opinion, one of the best sounding rotary engines uh, in naturally aspirated form kind of sounds a little bit like an old school F1 car, which is pretty special. Uh, the Obviously, the other aspect here with Rob's car is that it is tube framed and it has been converted to four wheel drive. So there's a lot going on there. It's a pretty in-depth interview and we get a bit of a feel for uh, why Rob decided to go down the route he has and the processes that have gone into it. So if you do want to learn a little bit more about Rob's car, Rob's build, then head over to our YouTube channel. If you're already on it, then that's going to make it super easy. If you aren't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, please make sure you do so. If you like that video, give us a thumbs up, and if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I just want to also uh, jump across to our Instagram here and just talk about uh, a post I put up a, a couple of weeks ago here when we were visiting Renvale over in the, the UK for our Goodwood Festival of Speed Tour back in the middle of last year, July 2019. And we talk a lot about the pros and cons of different techniques in the motorsport wiring industry. And uh, anyone who has followed us on social media will, will know that we are pretty strong advocates of of essentially never using solder when constructing a wiring harness. There are some well-known problems with solder, in particular the joint ends up becoming brittle. If it's not properly supported and strain relieved over time, vibration and movement can result in the wire failing right at the end of the soldered joint. However, for every rule there is an exception, so I just wanted to show the process involved in preparing some of the OE connectors that really aren't designed for a professional motorsport environment, uh, preparing those and getting them ready to operate reliably. So this is a, I think it's a, a hall sensor or a reluctor sensor three pins, probably a hall sensor there uh, that's being used in an F1 application. So we've got the actual sensor itself and normally as you can see here there is a bit of the plastic body which is normally where a connector would plug into. Now that's actually been cut down which can be a little bit hard to see in this particular shot. It's been cut down so that the technician working on this has got nice easy access to the terminals in there. And the idea with this is what we're doing is getting rid of the factory connector 
factor which can prove unreliable over multiple insertions and removals. We also see problems often with the pin tension or the tension uh, between the terminal and the pin and the connector and that can create uh, reliability problems which can be quite frustrating and quite tricky to also track down. So to give the best chance possible in this sort of situation where you are forced to use a uh, an actuator or a sensor that has a relatively low grade connector associated with it, we go through this process of potting. So what happens, as you can sort of see, it's halfway through the process here, we've got a couple of pieces of Tesla wire that have been stripped and they've been wound with the uh, conductors uh, attached quite nicely onto those terminals inside of the, connect uh, inside of the sensor. Uh, the next process of course is the technician would go ahead and solder the wires onto those terminals. So of course this does create the problem I've just mentioned, that potentially brittle area at the end of the solder joint. Now firstly, the technique is important here. What the technician is going to do is make sure that only the bare amount of heat, bare minimum amount of heat necessary to get the job done is applied and likewise only the amount of solder actually necessary is applied. One of the problems we see where people get a little bit over enthusiastic and carried away applying way too much solder, that solder with the heat applied is going to wick all the way up the wire and it can actually work a long way away from where you're actually working and it's again that's going to create that brittle area. So be a minimum of solder. The other aspect though is that once this, this connection is complete, once the solder joint is complete, uh, this area inside the back of the housing will be potted with epoxy. Uh, so that prevents any relative movement and that's obviously a big aid in helping reduce or uh, provide strain relief. Once that's done as well, well, the three wires that come out of this, this will, they will be twisted and covered in a DR25 uh, sheathing and then the actual sensor itself where the wires come out of that potting compound, uh, this will have a heat recoverable boot, moulded boot applied. So that goes further to, to just support the wires, those heat mouldable boots or heat recoverable boots I should say. Uh, very, very firm quite uh, quite rigid when they are recovered down so again just prevents any movement in those wires. So uh, the end of those three wires of course typically would be terminated to a Autosport connector and now you've got a nice reliable sensor. Of course the teams will also uh, hold on to numerous spares of all of these sensors and actuators, things like ignition coils or uh, injectors etc so that these can quickly be swapped over because uh, of course this does make a little bit tricky, you can no longer just go and grab a factory sensor or actuator and plug it in, you've actually got to have uh, spares that suit your particular wiring harness and application. So there you go, solder, we definitely want to be mindful of it but unfortunately there are some instances where it still is actually an advantage. Alright so before we get into our webinar today I'm just going to go through a quick rundown on as I mentioned one of the builds that we're really proud of so we'll head across and have a look at a few photos of this car and uh, if any of you following us are into the Mitsubishi Evo drag racing scene this may be a car that you're already familiar with. We uh, called this Project DS9, uh, the aim originally was to run a 9 second quarter mile and it is a Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 9. Uh, as we were building it though the aims actually moved a little bit and the owner of the car came to us and said hey look you know what I want to actually chase down the world record for the late model Evo four wheel drive chassis and at the time that it was held by AMS performance in the United States with an 8.42 I can't quite remember the mile an hour now we were a little bit nervous about getting involved in this project, uh, prior to this we had had a lot of success with my own shop car which was an earlier model Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 3 and there's some advantages with the Evo 3 in that first of all they're much lighter than the later model chassis, they're much simpler, there's no active centre differential, uh, the, the weight is a big factor here as well, we were able to get my old car down to exactly 1000 kgs fueled with driver ready to to hit the start line, uh, so 2200 pounds. Uh, it's pretty light without going crazy with composite panels. The late model Evo chassis, the CT9A chassis, uh, in, in 
inevitably they are a bigger car, they are heavier, so it's impossible to get the weight down to that sort of level. I say impossible, but at least much more difficult. So we hadn't had the runs on the board, so to speak, with the late model chassis, and this required us to go through a bit of a thought process on how we were going to approach the project, the build. And uh, just going back a little bit with my old shop car, when we built that, because predominantly I'm an engine builder and a tuner at heart, as engine builders and tuners, big numbers on a dyno screen are what make us happy. That's kind of the reward for uh, all of the effort we've put into developing and tuning the engine. So I actually fell into a trap that a lot of people fall into. I see it time and time again with drag racing, circuit racing and even street cars. Is I wanted as much power as we could physically make. And my old engine did exactly that. At the time uh, we retired that car, we were around about 1200 wheel horsepower. And yes, I know there are much more powerful 4G63s out there now, absolutely no doubt about that and hats off to the people developing them. Uh, there are a couple of caveats back when we were developing our car which is probably around about 10 years ago now, we didn't have the access to the billet blocks that are now so popular and it's also fair to say that turbo technology and head sealing technology has come a long way since I was involved. However, getting more and more power out of the engine also actually made our job a lot more difficult. Obviously as we make more power things break but the tricky part is actually getting the car to launch well and with drag racing it's actually the first 60 feet that really makes or breaks your run. The faster we can get to the 60 foot the better, that's the launch part of the whole drag run and there's a good rule of thumb, I don't know if it's entirely accurate but it kind of gives you an idea of the process anyway. Basically every tenth of a second we can drop at the 60 60 foot equates to about two tenths of a second at the end of the strip. So when you've got a lot of power, it makes it very, very hard to get the car reliably off the line. And then you're playing catch up, trying to use all of that power in the deep end uh, to try and dr draw back some kind of ET and mile an hour. It makes for an exciting ride, but it's not necessarily the fastest. And uh, to give you some perspective around that, the best 60 foot time my old Evo 3 ever did was about a 1.45 which is pretty lethargic by uh, modern terms. So when we factored in all of this, what we decided was we weren't going to go for outright power. Uh, what we were going to do instead is purposely keep the power a little bit lower. We're going to choose a turbo and an engine combination that provided a nice wide power band hopefully meaning that we were going to get better reliability out of the car and also more importantly we we're going to focus on being able to get the car out of the hole, get it to the 60 foot as quickly as possible. So back to our photo here, this is obviously on the dyno back at my old shop and uh, the engine combination that we've got here, uh, what we ended up going with was a 2.2 litre stroker kit for the 4G63 block, so this was still a 63 block. Uh, we swapped back to an earlier model Evo 8 head uh, the MyVec for our purposes, the variable cam control on the intake cam that the Evo 9 had, just not necessary. We're only operating over a relatively narrow power band and we also needed to run cams that essentially would have made uh, varying the cam control, cam timing much completely impossible. Uh, I'll swap over to another shot here. And uh, the turbo that we chose, and again, much better options on the market today, but this was a Garrett GT4202 turbo. Uh, we purposely swapped out the factory exhaust housing for this uh, Tile Sport uh, cast uh, stainless steel exhaust housing. Uh, there are a couple of reasons we did this. One was to reduce weight. I can't remember off the top of my hand, head what the weight difference was but I'm pretty sure the uh, tile housing was somewhere in the region of about half or less of the weight of the factory cast Garrett housing. The other advantage which is a little bit hard to see out of shot here is it allowed a nice simple uh, integration of the manifold so it's a V-band single entry there. Uh, we also use quite long exhaust runners so it's a bit hard to get an idea but they actually sort of scoot down around here. Uh, in this area here we used a burn stainless 4 into one double slip jointed merge collector and we can see here as well we've got some exhaust gas temperature sensors up here which uh, aid with our tuning, we're going to be talking about that later on. We also made sure we got a nice clean shot of fresh air into the turbocharger running a carbon fibre intake there which is force fed through the left hand side uh, headlight. 
So that was our idea there. What we were aiming for was around about a thousand wheel horsepower on our Dynapack dyno, uh, which we felt gave us enough headroom. If we wanted to go further, then we could. Uh, we could push the boost up further, but with that GT4202 and the 94 mil stroke 2.2 litre kit, that was something that we thought was going to work pretty well together, and we proved to be quite right there. Uh, the other thing, just keep in mind the engine specification. We wanted capacity there to help spool the turbo, but we also need to factor in that we actually needed to be able to spin this engine through to about 10,500 RPM, maybe 11,000 RPM in the deep end to get the mile an hour that we wanted. Uh, one of the reasons for this was the restriction on the available final drive ratios and also for the local class that this car needed to race in. It actually was restricted to a 24.5 inch diameter slick, which is quite a lot smaller than the likes of the 26 or 28 we commonly see. So that just means that for the same terminal speed we need to spin the engine hard. So that was why we went with that 94mm stroke. Lastly, while I'm on this photo as well, I'll just mention that in order to compete on a level playing field with AMS that held the record at the time, uh, we didn't want to go to a methanol fuel. Instead, what we wanted to do was make sure we were running on uh, a petrol-based fuel, petroleum-based fuel. In this case, we chose VP Racing Q16. So there's some considerations around there in terms of the compression ratio that we ran, uh, as well as the fueling requirements of the engine. So we built this car, it uh, dynoed up exactly where we hoped, 1001 wheel horsepower at 42 psi of boost and it gave a relatively wide power band so we're quite happy with that. Uh, just uh, on this shot here, this is from a Super Street uh, article on the car, we can also see the inlet manifold so we chose a hypertune manifold out of Australia, been pretty well proven to be a great performer, it was actually an old D-Sport uh, magazine shootout between a bunch of different an Evo inlet manifolds and I'm pretty sure off the top of my head that Hypertune one came out supreme. A really really nicely designed manifold, really high quality particularly the fact that the runners, the base plate and the trumpets that are inside of the plenum chamber are all CNC uh, manufactured, CNC machine. One of the problems we see with a lot of aftermarket alloy plenum chambers is that uh, the vibration will cause them to crack so we haven't seen that with the hypertune plenums because a lot of that construction of course is bolted together with the inlet manifold base plate, the runners etc. It's only the actual uh, plenum itself that is uh, is welded. The other aspect here is we've got two fuel rails here. Uh, so we ran two sets of ID1000 injectors and again this is just to do with the fuel requirements. Uh, with the fact that we're running on Q16 at the time in terms of our options for bigger injectors we had the Bosch in the blue 1600 terrible injector absolutely horrible thing didn't want to go near those the other option on the market at the time which is still around but has definitely fallen from favor was the uh, injector dynamics ID 2000 big enough injector to do what we needed in one single injector so it would have simplified things but the problem with the ID 2000 injector is that uh, the flow is very susceptible to certain additives in the fuel in particular one of the ones that being highlighted as MTBE which is a component of VP Racing Q16. So the ID, ID 1000s in a stage configuration run off a Motec M800 was the way we went with that. Uh, now one of the problems we actually found once we went and did some testing with this car and this is where we sort of involve a little bit of out of the box thinking uh, is that the driver, the owner of this car had never run anything that had gone down the quarter mile faster than about a mid 14 I think he had a Nissan Primera and uh, it all sounds easy when you're talking about running 8 and 9 second passes but there is actually a bit going on in there and getting it to all go right can be a bit tricky. What we found was uh, that Dave who owned the car was struggling a little bit with the shift. So what we had done, I think, uh, no I don't actually have a photo of it right here. Out of shot here on the shifter itself, what we used was an IKEA, I think it was, a sequential shifter. So it converts the H pattern uh, to a sequential motion. So nice and easy, you don't have to try and make sure you go across the gates. In particular with the PPG gearbox that we ran in the earlier cars, there are a lot of people have had trouble going from first into second gear, going from the top of second gear 
aiming for third and instead getting into first. Uh, obviously, when you go from the top of second back into first gear, probably pulling something like 12 or 13,000 RPM, it doesn't normally end well for the engine. So we swap to the sequential. That also gives us the ability to either use a strain gauge gear lever uh, or in the case what we actually used was a simple micro switch on the shift mechanism to allow clutchless shifting. So this just provided an ignition cut. All the driver had to do was start full throttle, dump the clutch on the start line and then pull back on the gear lever and the EC would take care of the work. So again, sounds simple in theory, however it didn't actually turn out to be the case. Dave had a lot of trouble with that so what we actually developed for this car uh, was this little mechanism here, actually this shows everything that I was trying to talk about. So this is the IKEA shifter, so again that's a bolt in option for the Evo 4 through to 9, uh, pretty easy to use. Not a lot of advantage I will point out here with a factory synchromesh box, in fact because it allows you to shift very quickly you're much more likely to beat up and damage the synchros in the gearbox, so uh, really only suitable for a dog engagement gearbox but uh, over here we had a hydraulic handbrake which was used as a staging brake so when Dave crept into the second beam what he would do is uh, load up the clutch a little bit so it was right on the take up point to reduce shock loading on the gear on the drivetrain and then he'd haul on that uh, hydraulic handbrake so the car wouldn't creep on the line and then he could go to full throttle uh, as the tree came down. Uh, so what we ended up doing there was uh, developing what we called the ghost shifter. It's uh, visible here but it's pretty hard to see what's going on. So this was an aluminium tray that was CNC cut and folded, we welded it up and it had an air ram on it. So basically the IKEA shifter bolted to the, this platform here, the aluminium body just sat below it and what it did was simply stick a air ram uh, with an onboard supply of high pressure air straight onto the IKEA shifter. Then we could just push a button on the steering wheel which I think we've got up here, there's a button on the steering wheel and the driver could simply press that button while at full throttle and it's like a rudimentary form of paddle shift, basically the ECU took care of everything after that. You can actually also in this shot see the compressed air supply on board there so we used a regulated supply at 120 psi and that was all actuated through this little MAC valve here. So in our instance we were only using this for upshift obviously it was only a drag car, uh, at the end of the strip the driver could manually shift down. Because we had uh, onboard supply of air on the car as well we actually also used this for the parachute release so at the end of the strip the driver could press another button on the steering wheel that would pop the chute meaning that the driver for the whole pass down the strip could have both hands on the steering wheel so pretty important. As I mentioned here this is only something that's going to work with a dog engagement gearbox and uh, this is the gearbox we used which was a PPG 4 speed gear set. Uh, so in stock form the Evo 9 came out in 5 speed or 6 speed format. We reduced this down to 4 speed, that's all we needed for uh, this particular application. Uh, I'm getting a little bit long here but one last thing I just wanted to mention as well uh, while we're talking about this car is that we also developed and I think this is probably the worst kept secret of four wheel drive drag racing, uh, we developed what we called a clutch slipper unit and now these days uh, these are available publicly, uh, the likes of Magnus Motorsport over in Canada have probably the best known version of this but at the time I think we had multiple people across the world really pushing the boundaries, probably developing these secretly in house and no one was really talking about them. That's exactly what we did on both my car as well as DS9. So the problem with a four wheel drive drag car is that it's a very very fine balance between being able to slip the clutch and get the car moving off the line uh, without it either breaking into massive wheel spin and just sitting on the limit uh, limiter or alternatively bogging. So that's why getting a reliable and consistent 60 foot time out of these cars cars is so damn tricky. Uh, so in a professional rear wheel drive drag car, something like a Pro Stock for example, they run what is called a slider or slipper clutch. So this is a purpose designed drag racing clutch. It uses adjustable base pressure as well as centrifugal weights on fingers uh, which basically adjusts the amount of clutch lockup or how much pressure is being applied relative to engine RPM. It's an absolute art tuning these, uh, these slider style 
style clutches and it requires a crew chief and a lot of work. Every pass the car goes and does, the clutch needs to be adjusted. So we wanted to try and incorporate some of that into a much simpler system. What we did was we used a Tilton or Quartermaster triple plate sintered uh, clutch, so nothing particularly flash there. In the ideal world you'd go with carbon carbon because they wear much better and uh, take a lot of the heat. And what we ended up doing was modifying a Turbo Smart manual or pneumatic boost T valve. So those are the little valves you can use for adjusting your boost. All it really has in it that's important to us is a needle and seat which allows very fine adjustment of the flow through the valve. We plumbed one of those into the clutch line and basically by adjusting the Turbo Smart boost valve or boost T we could adjust how quickly or slowly the clutch pedal would release. So what we ended up tuning to do was when the driver would put his foot all the way on the floor and sidestep the clutch what would happen is that the clutch would take around about a second and a half to come all the way to the top. So what this did was it allowed a controllable and also a repeatable amount of slip from the clutch and we could tune that to suit the track conditions and get a really consistent uh, launch every time. Uh, the downside with it was that because it's quite hard to get the clutch right onto the bite point and there's some latency in this system, it did result in a little bit of inconsistency with the ability to actually cut a good light. So uh, actually drag racing this car and beating the person in the other lane was pretty tricky but of course we were also going for world records so it was the ET and the mile an hour that was more important to us. Uh, it worked really well, we ended up with a car that never ever broke on the racetrack, uh, it also ran consistent 1.26 to 1.28 60 foot times, that's a 60 foot time that still holds its head pretty high uh, even with the Evos now in the 7 second vicinity so there you go just some insight, some backstory on a car that we're really proud of and I know this is sort of information that most people don't share so good to get a little bit of insight into our thought process on developing this car and what we were focusing on. Alright, uh, before we finish off we have got a couple of giveaways going at the moment that I want to talk to you about, get your name in the drawer, we have got this ECU Master ADU 7 7 inch uh, dash display and logger, we'll have a quick look at this under our overhead camera, uh, unfortunately I haven't got it powered up so I can't show you all of the display options, but basically everything you'd expect in a 7 inch full colour display, we've got the ability to have warning alarms, uh, set up down the side, of course there is a user configurable uh, shift light module across the top, uh, we have a multi pin connector on the back with the ability to mount the dash nice and easily. So this can be used for both a driver display as well as through Plex's, sorry through ECU Masters, let's get the right dash, uh, through ECU Masters data analysis software you can also analyse what was going on while you had your car out on the road or the racetrack. So one of the powerful things with any full colour dash logger like this is the ability to set up these driver warning alarms. There's a lot going on particularly out on the racetrack in a very fast powerful car and the driver doesn't necessarily have time to stop and look at all of the key parameters, maybe fuel pressure or oil pressure for example. With the ECU Master ADU7 what we can do is program uh, parameters for the likes of our oil pressure. So if our oil pressure drops below a certain value above let's say 3000 RPM you can get set that up to bring on a driver warning. Uh, this will notify the driver that something's wrong and then they can actually look at the dash to figure out what the issue is and decide whether they need to back off. Uh, so that particular dash is being given away in conjunction with a suite of our tuning courses and there is a link that the team will chuck in the chat that you can follow now to go and get your name in that drawer. Uh, there are only six days left for this giveaway to run, it's absolutely free to enter, it doesn't matter where in the world you are, we will ship that dash to you along with our uh, online tuning courses, so uh, go and get your name into the drawer. Uh, we are also running a, another giveaway here, we'll just jump across to my laptop screen, this is for our Ernest sister company, so Ernest is a fabrication and workwear clothing company, uh, it's a New Zealand uh, based company that uh, we recently took ownership of, probably about six or nine months ago now, uh, and specialise in 
producing really high quality workwear. And we've got our first shipment due in from China anytime in the next few days. And we're having a few problems, unfortunately, with the coronavirus that's put everything on hold. So we're a little bit behind schedule there. But we are giving away an earnest uh, and fabrication workwear package, which includes uh, a Squire Workshop apron. So it's a fabrication apron. Uh, the Harden overall, so great uh, quality overalls. Make sure that you don't end up getting ruining your own clothes when you're working on your car. Uh, we're also giving away a set of tungsten Tiggle MIG welding gloves, a set of safety glasses, a earnest hat, plus you're going to get VIP membership to the ETS Fabric Motorsport Fabrication School as well. If you've been following us for a while you'll know uh, what we've been talking about that a little bit. Uh, you can check out uh, ETS Fab uh, on Instagram if you want to get a bit of an idea of what's going on over there. So there's 22 days left for that giveaway to run. Uh, you can also get a few extra entries in with a few little tasks there are on that page as well. So again I'll get the team to drop a link in there that you can follow uh, to get involved. All right, I think that's enough talking from me. Thanks for watching there. Give me a few moments and we'll get started with today's webinar. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.